Yes, hello everyone. My name is Valeria Carrillo and I'm a digital archivist at the Archaeology Data Service. Today I'll be talking about digital preservation for 3D models and taking you through some of the stages of the archiving process at the ADS and telling you about common challenges that come up when working with 3D data. And today I will argue that good visuals support the dissemination of 3D data and can encourage its reuse for future research. With this presentation, I hope to add transparency to the archival process um, and the decision making follow that the ADS. And hopefully this is helpful for all of you collecting 3D data as part of your work and I think it could also be of interest to our colleagues from Historic Environment Scotland, as I'm sure they collect a lot of a lot of 3D data. And I'm also hoping this motivates you to get in touch if you're thinking about depositing your data at the ADS if you're not already doing so. So just a very quick overview of what I'll be covering today. I will introduce my case study, which is the former Curzon Street Station Yard in Birmingham. And after that, I'll cover 3D models and digital preservation. What are some of the challenges in working with 3D? And more importantly, why should we care? What are the implications of all of this for the Curzon Street archive, but also more broadly for how the ADS presents collections? So very brief introduction. The Archaeology Data Service is a core trust seal accredited digital repository. We're based at the University of York. It holds more than 40 terabytes of data and we carry out preservation through migration. And I do want to say a quick word about the former Curzon Street station, uh, just so, for some context. Before the construction of HS2, Birmingham's 19th century Curzon Street station stood as a pioneering railway station of its time. Um, it catered to passengers traveling from the London and the Birmingham Railway, as well as the Grand Junction Railway. And in 2020, during the excavations at the site of what will be the new Birmingham station, um, archaeologists, archaeologists found what is believed to be the world's oldest locomotive, Roundhouse. And this was designed by renowned railway engineer Robert Stephenson, who is the son of George Stephenson, also known as the father of railways. And here you can see where the roundhouse was. Um, inside the roundhouse, there was a turntable that turned around the engines so they could um, just go on their return journey uh, through the rail line. And it also served as a storage and maintenance facility for the for the locomotives. And we're talking about a significant artifact from Britain's industrial past that has great historical, social and scientific value. The old Curzon station suffered extensive damage during the Birmingham Blitz and it survived already two applications for its demolition. And it's now listed as um, on the Heritage at Risk register. Um, High Speed 2, the Curzon Street area was excavated by HS2, which is the UK's largest linear infrastructure and the largest dig in Europe currently. So you can imagine the archival legacy of a project of this scale and its potential to provide insight into the people and the communities that made modern Britain. And working with HS2 has been a great challenge for digital archivists at the ADS because we get to handle data sets from very interesting sites, but also a big challenge because we're working with large quantities of data and different file formats and complex data types such as 3D models. So earlier this year, the digital outputs from the archival program in the Curzon Street area 
were deposited at the ADS. We received large quantities of unstructured data and big files with no straightforward naming convention. And these included uh, 3D data in the form of 18 models, 18 processing reports, and around 2,000 photogrammetry source images. So how do we start to make sense of what was deposited and what it would look like as part of the final archive? Well, at the ADS, the preferred file format for 3D models that come from photogrammetry is OBJ. And OBJ is an open format that stores both geometry and texture, and it has open specifications, which is a big part of why it is suitable for preservation. And in addition to the OBJ, um, with its corresponding material and texture files, every photogrammetry 3D model should be deposited along with the original image data set that was used to create it. So these source images um, are considered the raw data and will be preserved as uncompressed TIFFs. We want to make sure that the original raw data is preserved in a way that enables future researchers or anyone interested in the site really to recreate the 3D models if needed, applying new processing techniques if they wish to, and reusing the data to tell different stories and share their own findings. Because uh, software packages can change and technologies and ways of processing and workflows can evolve, but the data from which the model is derived should hopefully remain the same. And on a related note, you may have noticed that project files are not suitable for deposit at the ADS. The reasoning behind this is that these meta shape or photoscan files only link through to the images, but don't actually contain any of, of the raw data. And it is true that the project files have information that can be useful, but exporting these in either a, mach a machine readable format such as HTML or a PDF can be a better idea, and these will be included as part of the archives documentation. Okay, so its preservation is very important, but showcasing the raw data as it is is not always very engaging or attractive. So for dissemination on the ADS website, 3D models are converted to a multi-resolution format, which is a Nexus file that can be, can be viewed on 3D Hop. And this is very nice because it loads more resolution as you zoom in. This is an example of, the, of a 3D model from the Elusive Sculptures project. And yeah, however, when viewed on 3D Hop, the 3D models from the Kirsten Street station, they looked more like this. So not exactly what we want for the archive of a high profile site. It was decided that making only the original models available was not enough. Perhaps 3D models enhanced by the ADS could offer a clear overview of the roundhouse and its related structures and present the data in a way that is both easy to understand and inspiring for others to reuse in future research. Yes, we want to provide secure long-term access to archives for historic environment data sets, but we also want to deliver high quality digital resources to the ADS user community. And I understand why it looks like this. It is very rare to end up with a model that has no flaws after processing the 3D data and things like poor lighting conditions and areas that were inaccessible during the data capture or vegetation or just other obstructions or working with bad quality images, um, they can all contribute to issues while you're reconstructing it. And noise in particular can really affect the appearance of a 3D model and more importantly, its functionality, which is something that we are interested in preserving, of course. So I first needed a good idea of what I was working with. So I loaded all of the deposited models to Cloud Compare and it looked very messy, but it helped me notice how a lot of the areas overlapped. For example, um, wall 
2165. This is one of the main features referenced in the archive, and bits of its geometry was actually registered across all of these models. And so tackling one structure at a time, I grouped together all the models that made up each feature so they could then be cleaned. And cleaning the 3D data from the Curzon Street station was a very detailed job, but I won't get too technical, don't worry. I just want to mention that these were the two main tasks. So aligning the meshes by selecting point pairs, and then deleting any floating triangles or noise or junk geometry, and then having clean and aligned point clouds, I went ahead and merged them. So I have one single model per future or structure. And then it was time to put this all together. I think that building this big jigsaw was probably the most challenging part because the 3D models were not exported using a single, a single um, coordinate system. So it was very hard to see where they were, where they were placed and how they related to each other. And at some point it got very confusing. I had to go analog and then I used aerial photos of the roundhouse to see what was documented in the 3D models and where it was and just how it all came together. So this is a summary of the workflow that I followed while working with the models. Assess the OBJ file and manually edit it if there's any issues with the texture, with the material, then align, clean, merge the models, export them as a single OBJ that we will use for preservation, and then as a PLY, which is what is then converted to Nexus and it can be used on the ADS website. And lastly, it was very important to create metadata that clearly stated the creation history of these enhanced models that can be used in addition to the original data as it was deposited. So provenance is all documented and visible on the website. So, okay, that's the process. Um, these were the results. A bit underwhelming, but I'll come back to this at the end. Let's go over some of the challenges of, of working with this data set. Um, we've talked about the way that 3D data is complex and you may have already noticed that we're missing a big chunk of the of the roundhouse and communicating with all the different companies that worked on site to track down who captured that missing data was a journey on itself but i do want to say that um just talk about the quality of of the 3d models but also just how having comprehensive metadata could have alleviated the archiving process and brought clarity to some of the reasoning behind why things were done a certain way and address this discrepancy between the purpose stated for the survey and what outputs were actually deposited. So, and yeah, more importantly, we came to terms with how our own visualization tools were insufficient to, or just not appropriate for what we wanted to do with this data set. And, Web visualization was one of the issues we could actually tackle, so this became the focus of our efforts. 3D Hope is what the ADS website look, uh, uses to disseminate models. It's open source and it can display individual large 3D meshes. Individual being the keyword here. The problem was now with the enhanced 3D models, we had around 40 models that wanted to be included in this archive one way or another. And Adam Fox, who is a, a collect applications developer at the ADS, worked on building on the 3D co co code package and blending it with our current uh, website templates. So multiple models can be turned on or off in the same viewer. And this is still a work in progress. The CSS styling needs a bit of tweaking so it works properly on mobiles, but it already looks so much better. And this is a very secret and exclusive sneak peek of what the archive looks like. Um, you have the landing page, you can navigate to downloads and then look at the overview of the roundhouse. Um, download the models if you wish to and toggle on or off to see the individual futures. 
And of course, raw data, very important. You can view the original models, download the original models. So what's next? We are approaching the end of this presentation and I want to tell you what's coming up. Uh, you'll be happy to know we found the missing data. Bad news, it looks like this. So more cleaning to do and also seamlessly combining data from different depositors and different creators is always interesting. So do keep an eye out for when this archive is released and play around with 3D Hope. We want to hear from you, get some feedback. And a few final thoughts that came from this work. I am now convinced that data cleaning is data analysis. It's not a dirty job that we do before we go and actually do the work. Um, it involves imposing value, judgments and interpretation into the data um, and transforming it, transforming it so whatever comes next can produce results that can be interpreted. So ensure cleaning is a way to get to know your data better, but it is so time consuming. And this kind of work takes a digital archivist a long time. So that's why there's a lot of emphasis in preparing the data before deposit. The ADS instructions for depositors detail requirements for depositing. So archaeologydataservice.co.uk is a place to go if you need guidance on data set structure, file naming, compiling metadata. I also talked about um, how it is very important to include information on who, what, when, where and how related to all of our results from archaeological projects. But I would also argue that quality metadata is even more important when we're talking about non-textual materials because without this additional information maybe we won't be even able to use things like 3d models and also just the point of building off of hs2 um, the scale and the complexity of a project like this and also well it has brought to the ADS sites that just challenge the way we work. But because of the way it's funded, uh, we've been able to experiment and build off of this work, applying it to other projects, to other archives. For example, part of the things that I've talked about um, are being used for, for this archive um, with the excavation at Welwick Farm. And now you can turn on or off this layer, which is like a coffin and reveal the skeleton that is underneath. And another great example is the work that Dr. Solange Bowling has done with disseminating bioarchaeological data. So have a look at her poster to learn more. And finally, the ADS is always interested in accessioning data from individuals and institutions. So let's talk. We can provide guidance to current and potential depositors on data management planning and digital preservation, or just have a conversation about what the process would look like if you're thinking about depositing, but you're not sure about things like file formats or file size. So yeah, that's everything for me. Um, thank you for listening.